Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bombs! Drop the bombs! We're gonna drop the bombs! This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Yes, sound bombing community. We are here, excited to be back with you again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, are listening to us on the radio, online, or all types of platforms. We're grateful that you are here. This is your friend, Dr. Lamar Darnell Shields. And as always, I want to thank you for tuning in. Because like the great Jay-Z said, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us today. And I really, really am honored that you're here with us today. If you tuned in last week, then you heard a really, really cool interview, uh, a really, really cool interview by by Mr. Con- Corner. And he talked about his amazing work around spirituality, his books, his children, how he's handling the, quor- the quarantine and so I'm grateful that you did um, stop by and listen to us today. And as always, I have another powerful pack show for you today. So we're going to take a deep breath, inhale. And we are ready to get started. How many risks do you take each week? If you are like most people, you take a lot of risks just by being human. Driving in traffic, you can get into an accident and relationships in and outside of work. You could be rejected seen as not good enough or not lovable, or you might mess up a presentation at work or school and the list goes on. The thing is there is risk in the world and you're not going to change that. However, what you can do is sound bombers, you can alter your relationship with risk by building risk resiliency. Risk is the interaction with uncertainty and there is a lot of uncertainty right now in the world. Resiliency is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty. Risk resiliency is the capacity to intentionally interact with and recover from difficulties related to living with uncertainty. Developing this skill involves two key factors. So come close. I'm going to tell them the ability to have awareness around risk you are facing, followed by the ability to have conversations about it with yourself and others. My next guest knows about taking risks because in 2012, Reed Goosens quit his job in Australia and moved halfway around the world to chase a goal. He moved to the U.S. without a job. He had no established network and no family members for support. He backed himself up and took a leap of faith. With limited funds, Reed purchased his first property, all cash, for $38,000 in late 2012. Since then, Reed has co-founded Windhorn Capital and now controls over $150 million worth of U.S. commercial real estate, and he has achieved financial freedom in the process. His first real estate investment journey first started back in 2019 when he picked up The Little Purple Book. Now, I love this book. This book was amazing and it still is amazing. What am I talking about? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This book opened Reed's eyes to a world of entrepreneurship that he was not aware even it existed. Up until this point, he was a subscriber to the conventional nine to five career path. Something inside of him didn't want to comply to conventional norms and that he knew he had more to give in his life 
than just sitting in a cubicle for the next 50 years of his life. He wanted to take control of his life and Rich Dad, Poor Dad was the book that changed it all. As the author of two best-selling books on Amazon, Investing in the U.S., The Ultimate Guide to U.S. Real Estate, and 10,000 Miles to the American Dream, our story of financial freedom, Reed believes in pursuing your dreams no matter what. Reed is also the host of the successful podcast, Investing in the U.S., wherein he interviews real estate investors, business owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and goal-getters who have successfully achieved financial freedom through investing here in the U.S. If Reed can move halfway across the world and achieve all that he has in such a short period of time, then you can too. And he is joining me in the bomb shelter to share his strategies. Reed, welcome to the show. G'day, Dr. Shields. Thank you so much for having me, having me on the show. Man, you have an amazing, an amazing list of amazing accomplishments that you've been working for on for a very long time. And I'm so excited to bring you on to the show. First of all, how are you doing since this we've inherited this international pandemic? Look, mate, uh, do, doing well, as well as can be, trying to keep some sort of normalcy in my life. Uh, I have a, uh, an office that I still am able to go to uh, every day because it's just myself in the office. <laughs> so still trying to keep some uh, being as normal as possible, working out, um, trying to be, you know, keeping the mind entertained, but also uh, using this time to, to focus on the business, developing um, assets within the business. We can talk about that, but also just de developing uh, and educating myself about new things that I don't know about. Um, uh, obviously, my my business you mentioned is in real estate, so I have a lot of renters who are currently feeling the pinch of this this, this shutdown. So trying to also navigate those waters in, in the in the management of my assets. Um, so, so a lot's going on, um, but but trying to from a personal level, trying to keep it um, at, you know just really as normal as normal as possible, and then on the business level, um, really trying to chart these unprecedented times. So. So, you know, preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. That's uh, that's what I'm doing. So so what I discovered in my research about you from what my uh, producer sent to me, and I am an avid researcher. You know, I like to I like to find out things about individuals from A to Z, not the basic stuff. So when I when I introduced you, I talked about risk. Now, you took a mm -hmm. major risk leaving Australia. And I interviewed uh, a gentleman last week. Um, Brendan Murph, who's a spiritual spirituality teacher who is actually from Australia, had a great conversation mm -hmm. about him following his plan of action and following his passion. You know, where did you get this spirit in you just to take not only just a leap of faith to leave Australia to come here, but just to be a risk taker? Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And over time, as I've, as I've matured, I think the, the real thing that I can answer to is it's what I what am I fearful? What, what what am I most fearful of in life? And for me personally, it, it, there's a couple of things. First and foremost, I know that I like uncertainty. I'm I'm a, just, I'm, a, I'm a person who can get comfortable with uncertainty, and I know a lot of people don't like that, but some, but I'm one of those people who do. The second thing is the fear of regret. Um, you know, looking back on you know, what if I'm 70 or 80 years of age, and looking back at a time in my life where I could have taken a risk or a leap of faith, as you spoke about. And I would be kicking myself if I didn't have actually taken that risk, right? And, and, and regardless of the outcomes, at least I gave it a go, right? And, and, and so what I'm, you know, hopefully to inspire your listeners today is to learn to back yourself and to learn to, you don't have to have all the answers planned out. I know a lot of people want all the answers planned out because they want certainty, but life is always going to be uncertain. And that's what you've got to get comfortable with. And you've got to get comfortable with opening doors, regardless of what that door might be, and regardless of what's on the other side of it, but you walk through it and you take, you give it a go. And because if you fail, that's okay. At least you had a go at it. At least you can say, well, at least in my mind, I had a crack at it. I gave it a go. I, I might've ultimately failed, but also I might also ultimately open up this Pandora's box of this incredible new life that I had no idea that I could even be, uh, you know, I could even go pursue. So there's just so many more benefits to taking to, to taking risks than not taking risks. And I, I think a lot of people focus too much on the, the negative side of risk taking than they do on the positive side. You know, it's interesting you you talk about that, man. I am um, a fan of the Chicago Bulls, and I just need to reference this. I mm -hmm. grew up in the 90s. Right now, ESPN has one of the top grossing 
shows right now. It's called The Last Dance with the Chicago Bulls. And if anybody knows anything about the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, you in Australia, I knew you knew about Michael Jordan. I mean, Michael <laughs> Jordan was a phenomenal. And there was a situation on there where Dennis Rodman, who was this player who was from Detroit and just, I mean, you from Australia as well, Dennis Rodman is an international figure. And Dennis Rodman approached um, Phil Jackson at the time, because we're talking about risk, and he said he needed to just to get away. He said, I needed to get away. And Michael Jordan is retelling this story, uh, Reed, and he says that Phil came to him and says, we need to let Dennis Rodman go to Las Vegas for two for 48 hours. And Michael Jordan said, Phil, are you out your damn mind? He said, if we let <laughs> Dennis Rodman go to Las Vegas for 48 hours, he would never come back. So they checked the clock. It was 48 hours. Then it went to, it was two days, three days, four days. Carmen Electra, his girlfriend at the time, Dennis Rodman's girlfriend says that she has a knock on the door. It was Michael Jordan who flew from Chicago to Las Vegas, dragged Dennis Rodman all the way back from Las Vegas to Chicago, got him back into working out and training. And what Dennis Rodman said about Phil Jackson is Phil Jackson understood him and what what Michael Jordan said he said we took a risk but we knew that we had to take a risk because Dennis Rodman was different from any player on the team he's the best rebounder that we've ever seen in this in this country with the sports but we had to take a risk to then do that and allow him to be who he was and then he came back and of course if you don't know the story they won all these championships why do yes, read? Why do? Why are some people hesitant from from? Or why do people run away from risk or shy away from from taking any type of risk in real estate or in life and in, in anything that we do? Well, look, it's a it's a very it's a massive question, right? You have to look at uh, um, within yourself. But the the biggest thing is is, is conditioning. What were you conditioned to to think? Are you conditioned from your upbringing to think more of um, the, the glass is half full or is it more the glass is uh, half empty or can the glass be refilled as many times as you want? <laughs> so I think it comes down to conditioning, um, but also learning to test your, not necessarily the barriers, but just getting, being comfortable, uh, getting uncomfortable. So doing things every day consistently that make you uncomfortable. And it might start with very small things like, I don't know, Challenging yourself to do a 5K run, right? That's it, it, and, and some people might be thinking, gosh, that's, no way am I going to do a 5K run. But you're getting used to doing these small little steps of being uncomfortable. And once you push through the uncomfortable barrier and you start in this new world and think, wow, okay, this is actually not that uncomfortable, then those are the small steps you take towards making big uncomfortable steps like investing in real estate or, or going and starting your own business or quitting your day job to chase a dream. All these bigger risks, that perceived risks, it starts from taking the smaller ones and getting comfortable taking those smaller ones. So it becomes part of your DNA, and that you just, you know, every day you're waking up like, like you know, Michael Jordan. I think there's that classic quote of like he, he shoots a thousand times and he's going to miss, but he's shooting a thousand times. He's doing it consistently. He's taking those shots all the time, so his body gets trained to know what to do. And in my analogy, be uncomfortable. And that's what you've got to get used to. And that, so that in itself can just take time and training and through mindset and through understanding, again, what I spoke about before, about understanding what those risks are. If you can sit with those uncertain and, and, and those, those fears or the reptilian brain and anxiety of what could go wrong and really assess them. Say, well, what really could go wrong? Okay, well, in my case, I moved, to, I moved from Australia. I quit my job. I chased a girl over here, uh, which is now my wife. Turned out that turned out all right, um, but the other thing was I didn't have a job when I first moved here. The, the worst thing that could have happened to me, Doctor Shields, was that I'd have to go back to Australia. I'd have to go back and get another job in, in Australia. My family's back there, and that was it. That was that was literally the worst case. Okay, well, if, I'm, if that's the only worst case scenario, well then I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go give this a crack. And and I'm just just sitting with that uncertainty and that anxiety, and then being calm with it to then ultimately make the decision say, yep, I'm going to go do this because this is literally the only worst thing that's going to happen to me and I'm fine with that, then I'm okay to go out and take that, you know, give it a crack, as I like to say. Well, as we but, can yeah. see, it's worked out for you. Let's talk about some risk <laughs> then. You know, you chased the girl over here. You got the girl. We are grateful for that. But let's talk about some risk involved in real estate investment. Are sure. there is, are there more risks right now in real estate investment than prior to this international pandemic of COVID-19? Uh, the answer is no, 
but to, 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 I'll, 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 I'll sandwich that with well, what do you what where are you at in your education mm. first and foremost people uh there, there's obviously a lot of news out there a lot of you know, fear mongering and all that sort of stuff when it comes to real estate investing it's pretty simple you've got to look at the numbers and the numbers are the numbers you can't you know you can't force them to be anything else so when you're looking at an investment uh to you know maybe a single family house well what's going to be the ultimate goal of that single family house is it to create you passive income are you trying to buy that house to flip it and make a massive profit well if you're trying to flip it and make a massive profit well maybe that's not necessarily the right strategy right now because people aren't necessarily buying because they can't leave the houses but maybe on the renting side well hang on i can make some cash flow and so it does make a good investment opportunity. So it really depends on where you are with your education on what you want to do with your money, right? And then ultimately, I've chosen the vehicle of real estate. You can invest in the stock market. You can invest in businesses. Um, you can invest in a whole wide range of things that can create you know, financial freedom. It's understanding the, the understanding the nuances of that particular vehicle, i.e. real estate, and what's the best uh, investment opportunity for this current day, day and age. And we're in covid so maybe renting is better than flipping right now because no one can see any of the flips because everyone's confined to their houses. So I, I sort of haven't really answered that question, but I've answered it in a way that there's, there's opportunities everywhere. And that's the, that's the beauty of investing is that there is opportunities no matter where you invest, no matter what er- era you invest in, that there's always going to be opportunities that come up. And so you have to just be aware of what those opportunities are and then react when they do come up. So it really comes back to education and, and what people are where they sit in that education process because you want to build a foundation when you go and start investing of quality education that you can then rely on that education to go make really smart investment decisions as we come into times like COVID-19. I'm personally um, excited about the, the, the investment opportunities that will come out of this, this you know, quote-unquote recession. Um, but I'm also, you know, under, mindful of the fact that there's a lot of people suffering right now. Not that I'm going to take advantage of any of those people, but, you know, there might be opportunities to buy cheaper property because um, the house prices have gone down because people can't get out and buy more houses because everyone's in their homes right now. So wherever there is um, uh, fear, like the Warren Buffett saying, when, there's, when everyone's running away from the fire, you've got, to run, you've got to sort of run towards it a little bit to understand where those opportunities lie. Um, so, so just keeping your eyes um, peeled uh, for, for good new opportunities coming out of uh, out of this COVID nineteen is, is is really really important. What are some things that you wish you knew prior to becoming a real estate investor when you arrived here and you decided to invest in property? What are some things you wish you knew? That's a good question. I've been asked that a lot, and 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 I've interviewed a lot of people and a lot of people have interviewed me and, and, and people say, oh, you know, and I, I, I talk to a lot of people at conferences, oh, I wish I'd started investing in real estate 20 years ago. I don't wish anything different, Dr. Shields. I, I personally believe that we're all on a different journey and, and, and if you're kicking yourself because you didn't know something, well, that's okay. You're now going to go learn it and it's going to be part of your, your tool belt, you know, the tools you're going to use to go off and make a decision in life. Um, so I don't regret anything that, you know, whether I did did or did not know it um, coming into real estate, the, the, the pure and simple fact it's my journey and, and, and I've, got to, I've got to be okay with that. And I think a lot of people, when they look at other people's success or they look at other, you know, back in 2008, oh, I wish I'd done this, this and that. Well, that's okay. You've got to stop having so hard on yourself and understand that was just part of your journey. And now it's going to make you a better investor or a better business owner or a better father or a better husband or a better son, whatever it might be. You learn from those mistakes, and we'll, we'll, we'll mistakes. We learn from those lessons in the past in order to help you forge a better future. So, for me, it's just part of the journey, and enjoying that journey is, is probably the best thing we can do as human beings. So, so yeah. I love that you call it a lesson and not a mistake, because it's something about words. Words are so powerful, and if we could just sort mm-hmm. of switch those things around, and I'm constantly saying, you know, what lesson am I supposed to get out of whatever this is, be it a sickness or an investment, or an opportunity when I was speaking on stage and it didn't go over well. I mean, you know those days. You go on stage, you right. prepare, yep. and you just sort of fall flat. But you all, you also ask yourself, what are some of those lessons? Speaking of lessons, you and I share something in common. We love the Purple Book, and that Purple Book <laughs> is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. What was it about yeah. Rich Dad, Poor Dad that inspired you the most? Well, when I, so for, for everyone out there, uh, I picked up that book in 2009 when I first came back um, from, I was doing a bit of backpacking around, um, uh, I moved to London to, to be an engineer and then I came back 
And and for me, it, it was just more of a um, back to the – actually, and I, I visualised this, it's back to the basketball analogy. It was more the fact that I knew I had more to give. I didn't know what it was right yet. And I felt actually like a basketball player sitting on the bench and watching the game, and the game was life that was passing me by. And so there was there was something inside me. I didn't actually know what it was yet. And what, what Rich Dad, Poor Dad did – was able to put what I was trying to search for and gave me some, not necessarily answers, but gave me some guidance on what it was I was trying to search for. And that was trying to become an entrepreneur, to try and become my own boss. And as soon as I read that book, it was the, the coin dropped for me. And I was like, this is it, of course. You know? and, and back when I picked it up, I had no idea what an entrepreneur meant. I didn't know, you know, an entrepreneur, it really is just a, a small business owner, right? We've just given it a cool new name. <laughs> so back then it was more to do with it. There was an opportunity to go off and seize and take control of your life and not have to, in, in, in my scenario, be you know, fed up of working in a cubicle for the next 40 years or 50 years of my life. I, don't, I knew I had more to give. I, I had more potential to, to go out and fulfill. So for me, it was just that it, it opened my eyes that there, there is another world out there that I had no idea even existed up until that point. Now, you mentioned a word just real quickly, but I want to come back to it. You talked about this concept of visualization. And visualization mm-hmm. is really a technique to affirm your desired outcomes. Do you use visualizations as you are an entrepreneur? If so, how do you use visualization? And then is this something that, that you picked up on your own or something that you learned from being a part of some type of other class or course or just some other teacher? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, as far as I can remember back as a kid, I've always, you know, you know, when like you want a bike or you want a new, you know, I really want a bike for Christmas or you really want, you know, for uh, for your birthday and you you, you want things as, as, as children. Um, I, I, I think my subconscious tells me that I used to, you know, I want I, I want a bike, so I visualize a bike. And no, no, I didn't, not that I knew what I was doing back then, but I, but it's always been around me. I've always wanted, if I wanted something, I'd have to sort of, you know, think about what I wanted, you know, I want a new, you know, a, a new dog or a puppy or whatever, you know, like, you, you know, not that my parents would get, my parents didn't give me much. They just did it. You always, I've grown up saying you've been a household where it's like enough's enough, so to speak. But when you, you still want things as a kid. So growing up, I, I, I definitely had that uh, sense of, okay, I want a bike. Well, what type of bike do I want? Well, I don't want a BMX bike. I want a mountain bike. And what does a mountain bike look like? You know? And so to answer the question is, I think it's always been there in me. I never was taught it, um, but it was more through wanting things as growing up as a kid, and we all have wants and needs, um, that, that I ultimately, I don't know if it developed a visualization technique, but it was more that, I, okay, well, ask yourself this question, well, what type of bike do you want? Oh, okay, well, it's, it's got to be a mountain bike, because I want to have it with, with 12 gears, you know, not, not one gear. So, so being, being very specific about the, the, the object in, in, in which you desire at that point in life. And obviously that's, man, that's manifested over time into, well, how, how's it going to look like when I do get a job in New York City when I move there? You know, I, 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 those anxieties that you have when I, when, I, when I first got on the plane to, to, to New York City, I didn't have a job. Okay, well, what's it going to look like when I do? I could feel that, it, you know, I, I could visualize, okay, I'm going to be walking down a street, big tall buildings, and I'm going to walk into an office space. But what type of office space is it? So all these visualizations that we, I have personally has, has grown and, and, and that part of my brain has been has developed over time as, as I've constantly wanted to push those boundaries that I spoke, spoke about earlier in order to achieve the goal. So visualization is very, very important. I don't think it was up until more recently, called the last five or six years, that I've understood the power of visualization. But when you reflect on it, you, we probably all have some sort of visualization in our lives as growing up as kids and into young teens and into adults that we just didn't know we were doing until someone put the word visualization in our own head. Uh, and then we're like, okay, yeah, I actually do, I actually do visualize things a lot. So it's yeah. interesting you say that. I think when people give us a word or context, then it sort of almost creates, it gives it more power because I'm an avid mm-hmm. meditator, and I, yep. I always tell educators that I work with. Now I typically start out with the breathing, as you can hear at the beginning of the show, some type of breathing technique. And I said to, I said to the teachers, I, I would have been a yogi 
at in kindergarten <laughs> or first grade if my teacher Miss Johnson wouldn't have stopped me from doing what I was doing when I it was called daydreaming I didn't realize it was actually <laughs> called meditation but she said boy you better stop that daydreaming over there but she didn't realize I was visualizing or I was actually yep. in my meditative state you know you know speaking of 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 the practice now I know you read tons of books on mm-hmm. business investment and also real estate what are some other books that you read that really support you in your effort to be financially stable, a, just a, just an all around good person to help you to build your portfolio of businesses? Are there any other books outside of entrepreneurship books that you read? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm a very I love reading real stories and journeys of other people. So autobiographies. Um, there was a book I read just recently called The Red Notice, Bill Browder, um, about his story about going to the Kremlin and, and, and you know, it's in and around finance, but just these, these interesting stories of people who are, tr- are real, uh, the, 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 the nonfiction. So I, I, I go to a more of the nonfiction type um, and get inspiration from other leaders in the world or people that may not be in business or investing, but they've been inspirational to other folks uh, along the way. So um, unfortunately, you know, and truth be told, my uh, my parents cursed me by calling me Reed. Uh, and up until you know, the fifth grade, I was in the remedial reading class until I realized I needed to, <laughs> you know, that's funny, I, I, I needed, I needed to, to pull the socks up. So um, I've all, I haven't been a huge uh, fiction reader uh, growing up. I was more of the nonfiction reader uh, and, and to this day, I, I sort of, gravitate towards those types of books yeah same way i like to read those those entrepreneurial books that may have like parables to them you know books Mm -hmm. like move who move my cheese a lot of a lot of those books have those parables that are in there so let's get down to some investment so we have some listeners out there who might be interested uh who want to step out on faith who wants to visualize owning some property what type of investments are available just to the average person and then how can someone who's new to real estate get involved in real estate what are those first steps yep so the, everything's the old saying everything's to sale at the right price right um it's kind of true when it comes to real estate uh to get started is in real estate you need to understand what is it that you want out of the, the investment and like any investment right you ultimately will take a risk whether you're investing in the stock market or investing in real estate and so is it to create uh, cash flow to support your, uh, your your W-2 job or to support your household income so you can have a little bit more financial ease um, so you don't have to you know, paycheck to paycheck? Is it to try and grow your, your investment? So i.e. you're going to get, um, uh, you, you, you buy and you hold for a period of time, you sell it for a profit in five or six years time. You have to ask, you have to really be granular on what you want out of your investment. And if it's a, if it's to make cash quick, Real estate's the wrong game. <laughs> There's no such thing as get rich quick, and anything worth building will take time, and that includes the real estate portfolio. So, um, understanding that you know when you invest in real estate, you're investing for the long term, and so when you're investing for the long term, you can have time is on your side in terms of making that your your investment nest egg grow. Uh, I personally like the cash flow model, which means I buy assets that can spit off cash flow and, and, and that can put money in my pocket like Rich Dad Poor Dad talks about. Um, but also I then cu- couple that with doing what's called forced appreciation where I can um, go in and make the property look nicer. Um, I can um, be a bit more operationally um, better with, with my systems and that can reduce expenses and that ultimately increases the value of the property. Um, but for those folks out there who are just getting started, the biggest thing that I first, when I first moved to this country, um, that you guys have at your fingertips. And it takes an international person because that's, I think, part of my superpower is that international perspective is that there are so many incredible informational resources available with probably in, in may most individual cities around the country. I, I know what I'm talking about is meetup groups. Um, it's what's a, a, an association called the Real Estate Investment Association, or RIA. They are everywhere. And I remember first coming to New York City and being blown away at the amount of free information or, you know, a couple of bucks at the door, you know, $10, $15 at the door, and you'd be able to get seminars, high-quality seminars, and it was readily available. And and I'd have to pay a guru back in Australia thousands of bucks 
to, to get that type of information that was readily available on, on you know, on the, at, at these meetings. So I would go out and seek seek out good educators, seek out people that you you aspire to be like, and get along to those those events so you can learn from those folks. And in the beginning, it will take time. You're building. I talked. I spoke before about foundation. Building a foundation of knowledge through reading books, through listening to podcasts, through spirituality, through uh, understanding yourself, but also through investing, they all can come together and they're going to form a foundation of knowledge. And for me, it was about when I first moved to the United States, I didn't, I, I'd already picked that book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. I was starting to self educate, um, but I had no idea of the, the, the incredible opportunities that would come my way by learning the art of investing through identifying opportunities, investment opportunities, that is, understanding how to value a business, understanding how to value a piece of real estate. They're valuable skills. And what I'm really talking about is financial IQ. And that's what Richard Porto talks about in his book is increasing your financial IQ. So I challenge the people who are listening to the show today, if you are interested in, in whatever type of investing, it doesn't have to be real estate, go out and find educational events. Not all of them are going to be the same. But go out and start going to meetup events. And I challenge you to go to two meetup events a month once we get out of COVID. Uh, and if you go to, I bet if you go to two meetups a month for the next six months, you will have, one, learned a ton of knowledge. But two, you will start meeting people who you aspire to be. And you then thus surround yourself with the people who you aspire to be. And you will then be the average of those five people. So that is a sort of start, stepping stones to creating that awesome foundation of education and knowledge in order to go off and make right decisions about well, what real estate investment do you want to go and make. So education is, is, is truly the first step to any any process of, of building something uh, over the long term. I like something, I like everything that you said, but I want, to, I want to pull something out of something that you said about one of your superpowers. And you said one of your superpowers is one is having like this this foreign, this foreign almost like, a, like a, a different IQ because you were a foreigner and you saw other things in this country that other people did not see one mm -hmm. of the titles of your book is 10,000 miles to the American dream with yep. the title of that. How do you define the American dream? Because you talked about coming here and seeing something that the other people didn't see. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I know we see that a lot. You know, one of my mentors said to me, we don't understand how powerful the sun is until it's gone. And so you come in <laughs> and you like, you yeah. have all of this stuff around you and you're not seeing it. What does the American dream mean to you and how do you define it? Well, the American dream is like the Australian dream. It's like the European dream. It's, it's, it's having a house over your head that you can afford and you provide for your family, right? It's the same across the globe uh, here. In, but, but like in Australia, like in America, like in Europe and the Western world, that, that quote unquote dream is becoming harder and harder to achieve. You know, the, the cost of living is going up. Wages aren't increasing at the same rate, which means it's harder and harder to, 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 to get break into the market. Um, and so the American dream, or the, what is called the dream to, to own real estate and to own your own kingdom, uh, whatever that might look like, is becoming harder and harder to achieve. And so what the book is, 10,000 Miles to the American Dream, it is about creating that financial IQ, back to that financial IQ piece, educating people in a way that what, what myself, and there's actually seven other co-authors in that book, that have all we've all Australian, we've all come across the ditch, and we created a we created this book together in order to share our stories. Because remember, go back, you know, I was talking. You asked me what books I like to read. Well, it's the stories of people who you aspire to be, and and we give the information and the education in a way that we as foreigners have come into this country in order to create financial freedom for ourselves. We've started to step out the way in which we can show others how to take the same steps. And and this isn't rocket science. It is just about being educated and understanding what is out there, how to, how to increasing your financial IQ, understanding how to read a, per, a profit and loss statement, and using those basic tools to then go off and make good investment decisions for the long term. And that's all it is. Um, so the American dream, back to the question, what is the American dream? The American dream is still the American dream, and that is to create um, you know, wealth for your family, um, you know, so you can create time that you can spend with your family in terms of uh, watching them grow up. We, in the book, 10,000 Miles to the American Dream, we just have happened to have used real estate as a vehicle to achieve that time freedom. We're not exchanging time for money at a job anymore. Our asset, our investments are producing us money when, while, while we sleep. And that's all that, that's all the American Dream is, is being able to produce capital for or wealth, grow your wealth over time whilst you're, 
you know, doing other things that you enjoy. So, so I love yeah. the title, 10,000 Miles to the American Dream. Now I want to go back a little further. I want you to share with our audience that moment in your life, and if it did exist, when that American dream felt like a nightmare, when you came here and the investments weren't working out, when life showed up for you and those personal challenges just kept coming and kept coming, what are some tools that you use to then pull yourself back up to keep moving forward in pursuit mm. of that American dream? Mm. Yeah, look, that's, and, 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 and for all your listeners out there, and same to you, Dr. Shields, like, I'm sitting on the show telling you about the good times. There is a lot of bad times. And when I say bad times, it's not bad times meaning a, a deal's gone. I've had deals go not necessarily south, but they've, they've been a bit rocky. Uh, I remember my first purchase I, I made um, uh, in upstate New York in Syracuse. I had a drive-by shooting at, at, at one of the properties I bought for 38000 bucks. First of all, it's um, too I, cold to be shooting in Syracuse <laughs> with all that snow. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I... But I, but I, but I Here's the thing: If I'd quit, if I said, "Oh, screw that! It's a drive-by shooting, and I'm putting in danger my uh, one, not only my tenants but two uh, the, the neighbours um, who probably lived there for many, many years," you know, if I had, had had quit, then I would never be where I am today. Um, it, it does get tough, and that's just that's that's and that's a that's the easy example. The the other examples are, you know, balancing a full-time job, which I've had up until 2017, and a life and uh, a, a, a side hustle, which was the real estate. And, it, and, and I had to, you know, I couldn't actually go and be my own boss until I got my green card, which was back in 2000, which is in 2017. So I spent the first five years in this country for working a full-time job, spinning all the plates, trying to have, you know, a life, trying to have a relationship with my, my, my then girlfriend, now wife, trying to be physically fit, trying to be, you know, all the things. And you, you feel like you're spinning your wheels and that it will never be, it will never get to the end. Um, I've been in those moments. I've also had personal loss. My mother passed away at the end of 2017, and I wish that and I'm being vulnerable now. I wish I was in the. I wish I was where I am today, but back in 2017, in order to spend more time with her, because ultimately that's what we want to do is we spend more time with our loved ones. And and I kick myself not every day, but I, I, I it, again, it goes back to that's my journey, and I've got to accept it. But the thing was, it, there's been tough times along the way, and you, I, they're, all, they're always going to be tough times. Life is uncertain. Life is unpredictable. It's about how you use um, meditation. It's about how you understand what your self worth is. It's about understanding, you know, the, the, how you kick in order to go and face those adversities. Because if you stick your head in the sand and think that that nothing's ever going to happen to you when you go down this path of taking risk, well, that's not going to be true. But the best thing to have is, is, is a good team around you, people to support you in order to, to make sure that you are successful. And when the times do get tough, you can turn to them for advice. That's really super important. But also understand, having the self-awareness, which is really important, to know that you can do this. It's just a little – it's a speed bump if you, you, you come across these, these – we'll call them lessons. Um, and, and just knowing that you, you're going to keep moving forward and it's just part of the journey and it's part of your growing, it's part of your learning – and you'll ultimately make you stronger because that old saying, what doesn't kill you will ultimately make you stronger is very, very true when it comes to the world of life, right? You know, because whatever, whatever path you go down, whether it be the investment path or, you know, on a personal path, whatever that might be, there's going to be challenges along the way. And again, going back to accepting those, that there's going to be challenges, you don't, might not know what they are today, but just know that they will be out there and you'll, you'll then be ready subconsciously for when they do pop up to say, hey, I've got the where for all to keep going and get it, you know, get back up on the horse, dust my knees off and keep, keep on going down this path. Man, it's really Reed, important. you brought the fire today, man. Let me just tell you, <laughs> I am over here just shaking my head. Like I am just so blown away of your transparency, how you're courageous in your words and you emphatic of what you're saying. Because again, you know, we look at the success, we look at all the money that you've made and all the money that you've made and all these individuals, when you look at the Trumps of the world, the, the the Buffets of the world, you know, the Gates of the world, these investors, a lot of times they don't talk about their failures. So I, I thank you for doing that. Now, I have a bunch of folks who want to invest in America. I have a bunch of folks who mm -hmm. want to be an investor and they want to talk to you. How can they get in contact with you? Yep. Yeah, the simplest way is head to my website. It's uh, reedgoosens.com. That's R-E-E-D-G-O-O-S-S-E-N-S. -E -E um, I live in Los Angeles, so if anyone you know wants 
uh, they open up the flights again. If everyone's coming through LA and they want to talk uh, shop about real estate, then you can hit me up at info, that's I-N-F-O, at reedgustons.com, and we can go up for a beer or a coffee or lunch or whatever. And, um, yeah, that's, that's the easiest way to get in contact with me. All right, before you leave, Reed, we have my favorite part of the show. It's called the Super Bomb Questions, and these are a variety of questions that I ask all of my high achievers that come onto the show. And as soon as I ask a question, Reed, I want you to give me the quickest response that comes okay. to your mind. All right, you ready? <laughs> All right. Let's do it. All right, brother, here we go. What is your favorite word? Uh, what's my favorite word? Uh, my favorite word at the moment is plethora. A lot. It means a lot. What is your favorite quote? Uh, a fool and their money are easily parted. What's your superpower? My international perspective. You, you said that earlier. I was going to see if you're going to repeat that again. What's your spirit animal? Ooh, what's my spirit animal? A horse. What moves you to tears of joy? Surfing. <laughs> <laughs> what moves you to tears of sorrow? Uh, loss. What do you wish you Meaning had? Meaning human loss. All right, say, all right, let's go back. What brings you to tears of sorrow? Human loss. What do you loss wish you had more time to do? What I wish I had more time to do right now, travel because we can't do we can't travel. So when it takes away, uh, that's what I miss the most right now. I do too. I do too, brother. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? An investment in myself. It sounds cheesy, but it's true. It's it's going and in, in investing in yourself. It's the best investment you can make. Walk me through your morning routine. Give me three to four things you do every morning to start your day. Okay. Two things. Uh, the phone's got to be switched off from 9 a.m. till it doesn't come on earlier than 8 a.m. First and foremost, I get up about 6.30 every morning. I take the dog for a quick walk. And I come back and I do a breathing exercises with, uh, with a bunch of daily mantras. Uh, and then I stretch um, because I'm, I'm six foot two and I just I, I work out a lot. So I need to stretch. And then I have breakfast. And then at, at that point, it's probably around eight o'clock. And then I'm, um, I'm off to the day. I'll, I'll, and I'll work out in the morning. So I'll, I'll always work out on, on my mornings. Uh, and then I'll be able to start my day after that. All right. If you were in the Mr. America talent competition, what would your talent be? The Mr. America talent, what would it be? It would be, oh, what would it be? I don't want to say anything cheesy or dumb. <laughs> uh, it would be uh, trying to inspire everyone to just be a good bloody person. And I don't mean it in a, in a cheesy way. I mean it just more in down to earth, no ego, and just be, just be good. Just be good people. You know, that's, that's what I try to try to be my superpower. Well, Reed, my spirit says that you are a great people. And I want to thank you for joining me today in the bomb shelter, man. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Mate, Dr. Shields, you are a legend. Thank you so much for having me on. I really love what you're doing. So keep it up. All right. And I would like to thank my engineer, Alec Blanc, my producer, Kimberly Peterson, Supremacy for our theme music, and all of you for listening, all of my sound bombers out there. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe, leave a comment and stop being stingy and share me with all of your <laughs> friends. If you want to know more about me, you can visit drlds.com. That's drlds.com. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to ha happen and that some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. Thanks for tuning in and do something for someone other than yourself today. You've been listening to Sound Bombing. Peace.